I'm Ms. Kramer and we're at Bunker Middle School. We're at the pool here. This is for parent-teacher conferences. And we're highlighting uh, one of the projects that the student did in, uh, students did in conjunction with the Muskegon uh, Museum. This is uh, Andrew and this is Michaela. And they uh, participated. They were on two different teams, so they weren't on the same team. The students were in uh, groups of four. And they were given a bucket of parts and told to build a vehicle that could operate underwater going forward, backwards, up, down, left, and right. So how did your team do? What, what do you remember uh, about the experience? What were some of the challenges? It was hard to make it f stay afloat, um, right? And um, the other team members wanted to make it small so it would be easier to control. OK, so you were focused on it making it smaller so that it would mm -hmm. be easier to control. OK. And you said you had trouble with what? The buoyancy? Yeah. Making it neutrally buoyant? Mm -hmm. OK. You remember why you needed it to be neutrally buoyant? Not really. <laughs> Michaela, how, how about you? It was supposed to be neutrally buoyant the way it wasn't floating uh -huh. on top of the water and that way the motors weren't hitting the floor. All right, good. So you want it right in between so you could control? Yeah. So you had uh, three motors on it. How did you arrange your motors? How did your team decide to do it? We decided that we were going to have our three motors one facing up and down, okay. one to the side like this, uh -huh. and one uh -huh. that was um, horizontal. Okay. Now, as I recall, did you go with your first design? No, we did oh, not. Okay. Well, what happened? Well, our first design did not work because, well, it kind of exploded. It exploded. Okay. <laughs> All the parts flew off and the motors fell off. Uh, okay, so when you put it in the water, you turn the motors on, they, it kind of went all different directions. So it just kind of... Yeah, we... Yeah. I think it was more of the float. Okay, okay. Because it was in the middle, but once we turned it on, it kind of went down. Uh, so Andrew, what about your team? How did, how did they do it? Did the first, um, did the first design work? Yeah, Okay. What we used. Okay, so you, you got it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just had to add a little more um, flotation to it. Okay, so your biggest struggle was getting it to yeah. get it the right buoyancy. Okay. So now, if I remember right, how many times did you rebuild, your team rebuild your design? Well, me and my team rebuilt ours three times. Three different <laughs> times, all right. So you kept going at it, persistence. Well, I had a lot of help from my team members. Okay, okay. So did you make, how did you decide when you made changes? What, what when made we made changes, change? we decided that we would make it either middle, uh -huh. not quite large and not really small, uh -huh. or smaller because at first ours was bigger, so yeah. it was heavier. Yeah, okay, okay. So you decided to change it because of the size of the facility that you were using yeah. in terms of, yeah, okay. So you adjusted it according to what you learned. So first we learned about placing motors, right? Yep. So that they wouldn't fall off. Then you uh, learned about the uh, sizes, different sizes, and make it more compact. Yes. And then what was your, what do you think your third big lesson was? Our third big lesson would be trying to make sure the parts didn't come apart. Oh, make sure the parts stayed and didn't come apart. Yep. Okay, Andrew, what do you, what do you think your, your biggest challenge was? The flotation. The flotation. And so. When we were first building it together, we couldn't think of a design. Uh -huh. When okay. we were using the straws to make okay. a model okay. before we actually made the real thing. Oh, okay. So you're, you went back to the, the model and you were designing with the straws first to give you an idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. did, did you have uh, working together as a team? How did that work? Did that it come was, together easily or yeah. did you have some difficulties? It was kind of easy, but okay. with Daquan Sabi and him, it was. he was also jumping around as well. Okay. So you had a lot of enthusiasm mm -hmm. in, in your team. So. So, but you work together well. Okay, that's good. And your team seemed to work together well also, too. Yeah. So, and you were, again, very persistent. So a number of the teams, sometimes it worked fairly well the first time, and they kind of stuck with that design and, and just went with it. And sometimes they had to go back over and Not over. Not more, sometimes yeah. more like a lot of times. <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. So a lot of teams had to rebuild and redesign. So that was good. So overall, what was the, what was your, what do you take away from the experience? I think it was very fun building the different ROVs, mm -hmm. and I also think that it was a smart way to get people to work together. Ah, okay, smart way to get things. What about you, Adner? What do you think? I think it was a challenging project uh -huh. for uh -huh. some people, building with the ROVs, with working on with like that kind of stuff for the first time, like right. I was. Right. And, but it was also fun at the same time. Uh huh. Okay. Well, with being like working as a team okay. and not. 
fighting like some team members probably were. <laughs> well, actually, uh, we didn't have too many people fighting, but yeah, that could have that could have been a problem. Was it? it wasn't so much fight as no. arguing. Yeah, it's just hard work. Yeah. So, can you relate to engineers and scientists what they have to do when they're given a problem? I think the different designs will be hard to make out. Yeah, yeah, different designs. Yeah. Agreed with Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Good. So you're you're ready to do it again? Yep. All right, good. I would do it again. So have you been able to operate the uh, one here from the museum, from the uh, Muskegon Museum? Have you get a chance to, to yeah. play with the real ROV? Wait, no, uh, that one? one? No, haven't? I haven't yet. Oh, okay. Well, you guys are going to have to go do that. We are. All right, good. Okay, operating the ROV, it's very important to keep control. It runs with a joystick, but it's a very, very sensitive joystick. If I push it too hard one way or the other, it'll just, it runs really wild. So you want to run it slow and keep control of it. Bring it back. It, the ROV does have lights on it. So if you're underwater and you need to see, you can see with it if it's down enough. It also has a gripper on it so that you can pick up something on the bottom if need be. It goes forward and backward. It has a forward and aft camera. So the forward camera is color, the back or aft camera is black and white. It, uh, it's very, very fun to drive. Normally we find out that a lot of the parents say, go away kid, I'm having too much fun driving it. Because it is, it's really a hoot to drive. It's a very buoyant, so that wherever you sh set it, it'll stay at that level. It's designed to go down to over 500 feet. We have used it out over shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. Gives an opportunity to see a lot of those things that people would never get a chance to see with the ROV and the camera. Hi, my name is Mark Gleason. I'm with the Great Lakes Naval Memorial and Museum in Muskegon, Michigan. I'm the Director of Education and what we're doing here with a lot of different um, students of all ages is called underwater technology and we're using underwater robotics um, to help people to better understand not only the underwater world but also STEM education. The way we're doing this is we have small kits that we actually bring to either a school or to an organization like a, a scouting group or people can come and visit our museum and with these kits we divide groups of people into small teams of four to six people and they actually build an underwater robot that they can drive in the water and once again we do this from grades 4 through 12 as well as college students and I've actually worked with people in their 80s doing this kind of program. The reason we do this is because this helps people to better understand STEM education as well as to better appreciate the underwater world through the use of technology. This type of program was pioneered by people like Dr. Robert Ballard, the discoverer of the Titanic, in his use of um, robotics in the Jason program. We've added to those programs by actually adding these hands-on activities where they actually, where students are allowed to build an underwater vehicle. Some people like to know where we came up with this idea. It's actually come from a number of different sources, and we've, of course, have added to the program. Um, NOAA has some programs where they use bucket kits like we have, as well as MIT, and also the MATE program out of California does programs very similar to this, where they encourage young people to design their own underwater vehicle and, and involve themselves in competitions. The uniqueness of our program here in West Michigan is the fact that we add to it a real ROV. The real ROV that we use here is professionally built and is capable of diving down to 500 feet and we allow the students to actually drive that. When I was working on my dissertation, it was one of the activities that I found to be very useful was to let young people to actually have hands-on experience with real scientific equipment such as this ROV. And when people say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, well, I like to always point out that the vehicle they're driving runs between thirty-eight and fifty thousand dollars if you were to go out and buy one. So the students are actually buying, or are actually driving, not buying, driving a real vehicle. 
Often people think that the little robots we're building here are just toys, but the reality is the vehicles that we build here can be used to do all kinds of different research activities. And once again, we are exposing the students to the use of a real ROV. The real ROV that we have here can dive once again down to 500 feet, has been used by local police departments as well as the U.S. Coast Guard to conduct searches. I personally have used this particular vehicle to work overseas in the Middle least on oil and gas rigs. So while these vehicles may look like they're small little toys, they're far beyond that and they can actually do real work. We welcome people um, with questions about this program and we would like people to understand that we can travel anywhere in the Great Lakes region as well as even further. We've actually taken this program as far as Florida. So if you're interested in having us come and do a program at your school or at your um, community group, we'd be very happy to, to come over and do that. Or we're very willing to welcome you at our museum. The way to get a hold of us is to call 231-755-1230 and ask to talk to somebody about the Underwater Robotics Program. Actually, I'd, I'd like to conclude with two points. First of all, during my dissertation, we found that being involved in this particular activity, using underwater technology, really helps people to better understand the underwater world and appreciate what we have here in the Great Lakes. That's one thing I'd like people to remember. And then the second thing that we found fascinating, this also came out of my dissertation study, is that this technology is of interest to people of all ages and all backgrounds. I have run these classes once again with third and fourth graders and they like it. I've done it with U.S. Coast Guard um, personnel, I've done it with police officers, I've done it once again with people that were in their 70s and 80s and across the board people are very interested in what's underwater and using this technology allows them to get out and do that.